not yellow, not yellow, or orange, or orange okay, purple, purple, purple it is. Physics time, and today we are talking about gravity. Let's call it universal gravitation. Universal gravitation. As we just said, in the whole universe, any two objects with mass are attracted to one another. The, the, the nature of having mass also makes any two massive objects attract each other. And when I say massive, I mean in the physical sense that they have mass. In our uh, colloquial speech, we sometimes say something is massive when it's very big, but anything in physics that has mass is said to be massive. The objective, as you can see, is synthesize information about gravitation. Synthesize information, information about gravitation. What's one source of information we have about gravitation in this chapter that you have done? The book, the discussion, what we're doing right now. What else? What, are, what, what other place? From where else would we synthesize information? Hopefully, hopefully your what that you did, that your lab, ideally. You did a good job on your lab probably, right? 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 <laughs> um, so gravity is exerted as a force. Gravity is a force. Gravity is a force depending. Let's put it's a force between two objects. That's better. Between two objects. Any two objects? As long as they have mass. So we'll put massive objects. I'm really adding stuff to this. I'm going to put gravity is an attractive force. What what might that mean? Or I mean, you know what the word attractive means, but what? Why might we specify that? It's an attractive force between two massive objects. Depending on, we'll get to that. But yeah, they, it is never repulsive. Gravity only ever attracts objects. Unlike what other force that sometimes repels? Big explosions. No. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, you can have, but in the, it's the electromagnetic is what I'm thinking of. The electromagnetic, but depending on the charge of um, electron, the, well, electrons are always negative charge, but depending on the charge of the electromagnetic force the, between two particles, it may repel. Remember, opposite charges repel, same charges, uh, sorry, opposite charges attract, same charges repel. You remember that. And so in the electromagnetic force, some forces can be repulsive, but in gravity, it's always attractive. So gravity is an attractive force between two massive objects depending on, depending upon the masses of the objects and what else and the distance between them how is it how does it change with the masses of the objects if the masses of the objects or either object increases This is the part of the video where I just leave the room for a second. Um, if the mass of either object increases, what happens to the force between them? Yeah, it's greater. So it's directly proportional to mass. So the force of gravity, this marker I just got out and it's not better. The force of gravity is proportional to the mass of either of the two objects. Either of the two objects. So it's a greater mass of either object increases the force between both of them. What is more strongly attracted to the force of planet Earth? My, my teacup or me? Try again. Try again. You got it. The question was, maybe if I say the question again, Justice, you'll understand the error of your wicked ways. Um, the question was, which object, my teacup or me, is more strongly attracted to Earth's gravity field? Me. Why? Because I have greater mass than my teacup. You can tell just from looking at me. I have greater mass 
than my teacup. Um, but did the Earth's mass change? No. The Earth's mass is the same in both cases. But the one mass being greater increases the mass to both. Now, listen, this is where it, sometimes it gets tricky for people. In my field of gravity, what has more, well, let me think of how to phrase this. Which, which is, in which gravitational field is Earth more massive? My gravitational field or the teacups? No. Try again. Mine. Because I have more mass. Again, the, gravity, the force of gravity between me and Earth is the same in both directions. Let me, this is not really a side note. This is an important thing. But here's, here's your boy. Right, and I, yeah, I, I am in this picture kind of large, but here's planet Earth. This is meant to represent planet Earth. Um, the force of gravity from my center of mass to Earth's center of mass. So there's the distance between us, right? I have a mass, the Earth has a mass. Of course, I'm mass one, and the Earth is mass two because I'm self-centered. Um, but the force of gravity between these, in, 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 encapsulating all of that information, the force of gravity between these is the same from the Earth to me as me to the Earth, right? F sub G on Earth by Mr. Kime is equal to F sub G on Mr. Kime by Earth. What does this kind of remind you of? What, which of Newton's laws does this kind of remind you of, hopefully? On Earth by Mr. Kime is the same as on Mr. Kime by Earth. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. This is Newton's third law. This is another way. This is another uh, way of thinking about Newton's third law, at least in the context of gravity. And so, within my gravitational field, Earth has a mass. Let's say, let's say my mass. Well, I'm trying to think of what it would be. Even. The force is the same. Yep, force between them is the same. Um, exactly right. The, I'm trying to think of what my mass would be. If I, let's, let's say that I have a mass of 720 newtons. That's about right, I think. Yeah, that's about right. Um, let's say I have a mass of, or a, a, sorry, not a mass, the force of gravity acting on me from Earth. My weight is 720 newtons. Also, in my gravitational field, the Earth's weight is 720 newtons. So those two things have to be the same. The force that Earth pulls on me has to be the same as the force that I pull on Earth. Right? Does that make sense? So how come then, when I jump, woo, how come the Earth doesn't rise up to meet me? We've talked about this before, but now we're talking about it in the context of universal gravitation. What? How come the Earth doesn't rise up to meet me? Okay, but it's also pulling the Earth up, is what I just said. So how come the how come I seem to move and the Earth doesn't? No. Okay. Yeah, because you're you're on the right track. It's because the Earth has more mass, and therefore it's harder for it to accelerate. The same force acting on both, right? The same force, the same 720 newton force. I only have one arm in this picture. A 720 newton force up on planet Earth is not going to move. It's not going to accelerate its very large mass. A 720 newton force down on me is going to accelerate my smaller mass. Does this kind of make sense? It's, it's a, this is a tricky thing for people to get, but remember Newton's third law, that whatever I am pulled on by Earth, I also pull on the Earth down. And not just the Earth, but any other object in the solar system. Or the galaxy. Or the universe. And that's why it's called universal gravitation. This works for any two massive objects, as long as we know their masses and the distance between them, and we multiply all of this by a factor of g. Where f sub g is equal to, what is that? Or sorry, I should just write is, is what? What's f sub g stand for? Force of gravity. Expressed as another word, what do we also what do we sometimes call the force of gravity acting on an object? It's no, it's weight. Force of gravity is weight in this particular gravitational field, in whatever gravitational field we're talking about. Capital G is the universal 
gravitation constant. And we not only know the units for this one, we have to have memorized its, its actual numerical value, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. And I, I sometimes forget it should be in... Mm, Yeah. It has a unit. So it's definitely going to have second squared. Does it does your book tell you what the unit is? Second squared is definitely going to be in here somewhere. We'll, we'll look that up later. I, I forget the unit or maybe my book tells me Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. Newton meter squared per kilogram squared. And just for the record, second squared is in there. It's just within the Newton. And then M1 is some mass, mass of object number one. M2 is the mass of object number two. And D is the distance. What do we measure masses in? Kilograms, of course. What do we measure distance in? meters. But we, uh, we square this distance and these two multiplied together give us uh, um, a kilogram squared. So that drops out that. The distance squared drops out with the meters in this unit. We're left with just newtons. So memorize this number. And you can do this for any two objects as long as you know the, their masses and the distance between them. Now, how far am I from planet Earth? Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly what I'm getting at, is that these, this distance is from center of mass to center of mass, from center of mass of one object to center of mass of the other object. Oops, sorry, one. Does that, do you see why that's important? Because there's a, if I just say how far away I'm from planet Earth, well, I'm, in a way, I'm touching planet Earth, right? I'm zero meters. Or, or in another example that we sometimes use, if I know the mass of this dry erase marker. According to this, I can calculate the force of gravity between these, right? They have some mass, they have some distance between them, but what if they're touching, doesn't this get down to zero and zero squared is still zero and I've just violated all the laws of math and the universe and that's how I get a black hole? No, because it's actually their centers of mass. I can't, that's this, you can think of this equation as one of the, maybe not reasons, but explanations for why these two things can't inhabit the same space. Right? If they phase into each other and have no distance between them, well, this equation breaks completely. Do you see? In fact, we're going to talk about black holes, and that's, that's one of the things that is true of a black hole. It's something like a divide by zero error where it has no volume. It's infinitely dense because it has some mass in no volume. Anyway, this equation can be used to calculate the mass of, or sorry, the force of gravity between any two objects as long as you know their masses and the distance between them. There's this neat uh, thing that happens here where if I'm going to raise 120 newtons and we're going to say that your book is kind of in depth in this uh, thought experiment of if you drill a hole all the way through, this is a cross section of planet Earth. Now you drill a hole all the way through. There are some probably some issues with this, right? Um, it'd be hot for one. And drilling doesn't really go like this in real life. And the Earth's a lot bigger than people think it is. But if you go, if you have this hole all the way through Earth, okay, and you jump in it, right here, what will your acceleration be? Not just like right on the surface. What will your acceleration be? No? What, remember the, the acceleration due to gravity on Earth's surface. 9.8 meters per second squared. What's going to happen is that as you fall, right, 9.8 meters per second squared when you, is the acceleration that you start out with. When you get to about, let's say here, what's causing you to fall? What force is acting on you causing you to fall? Gravity, and that's caused by mass, right? But when you get to about here, you've got this much mass about below you, right? Still pulling down on you, but you've got this amount of mass kind of pulling up or out on you. You see that? So now your acceleration actually goes down because you no longer have that strength of gravity pulling on you because the mass that is pulling on you has decreased. And by the time you're in the middle, you, you don't explode. Well, you do, you would keep falling, um, but by this point, you actually have zero acceleration. And when you keep going, which you would keep going, 
because you, you would still have some speed, you just not your acceleration is decreasing. Um, at this point, there's zero acceleration, zero acceleration. Um, as you keep going, you're actually going to be accelerating in the opposite direction. You're going to be slowing down because there's more mass below or pulling you that way back towards where you started. And so by, by the time, coincidentally, not coincidentally, the laws of physics say, which is the opposite of a coincidence, that by the time you get here, you will be stopped. All of this negating friction, of course. So if there's no friction, there's no heat problems, there's no lava monsters or whatever, you would just oscillate back and forth forever. Because by the time you get here, Earth's mass will be pulling you the other way. By the time you get back up here, the Earth's mass will be pulling you that way. You just oscillate back and forth. And at that point, in the middle, you'd have no acceleration. Which is kind of an interesting thought experiment. And it does a lot to express to us the way gravitational fields work. And then, yeah, by the time you get down here, China. Yeah, yeah. That has the Chinese Communist Party flag, yes. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, you'd you'd be you'd be in big trouble. Um, another thing your book goes into some detail about. And we'll talk more about this in coming chapters, but the idea of weightlessness and the feeling of weightlessness does not mean you have no weight or there's no force acting on you. Weightlessness. I'm going to put this in quotes. Weightlessness. That feeling, and you felt this, right? You you feel this um, when you're going. I don't know if you've ever been on a roller coaster. I haven't. But when you're going down the hill of a roller coaster, the feeling you get in your tummy is weightlessness. Or sometimes even uh, something like a roller coaster, where you're going down West Ash and you're with a crazy driver and you kind of go over a hill too fast and you get the feeling in the pit of your stomach like, whoa, that's weightlessness. Or when you're on the swing on the playground and you, you've, gotten, you've pumped yourself up so high that you get to the top and you are momentarily, you feel the slackening of the chains, right? That's weightlessness. And that's a feeling. That's a real feeling in so much as any feeling is real. But it's caused by falling. We, we might put in parentheses free falling, like the Tom Petty song. You're not actually devoid of weight, right? It's not that the force of gravity does not act on you in that moment. And I want you, this seems pretty apparent, right? If you're thinking about the roller coaster or West Ash or the swing set, it's pretty apparent that you don't, the gravity hasn't been switched off. You don't just like, whoa, you know, you're floating around for the rest of your life. It's, it's obvious at that point that it's caused by falling. But I want you to entertain the notion, this true notion, that this same feeling is what astronauts feel. It's not caused by, as some people, many people think, idiots, um, that they're out of Earth's gravity. We just said that you, gravity is universal, right? You can't get out of Earth's gravity. Literally everywhere in the universe is in some way or another within Earth's gravity. Um, but in a real sense, they're not even outside of the reach of Earth's gravity as the major force. They're just falling. This is true even in space. In the space station, even in the space station, they are what? Weightless? Falling. Not in a real sense. They are falling. It just happens like this. Well, I'm going to keep using my same picture of Earth here. I'm going to erase some of the notations I have. But um, the way, and we'll talk about this when we do our orbital mechanics unit next time. Uh, people think the point of a rocket launch is that you launch your rocket, and it goes to here. And it's just out of Earth's gravity and just kind of floats there. Exactly right. Um, you have to launch it up a little bit to get out of the atmosphere. But then what really makes it orbit is it starts going extremely fast in the horizontal direction. That's what makes it orbit. So now what happens is that every second that passes by, it is being pulled in by Earth. Just like our circular motion unit, right? Inertia or its velocity would have it go this way, in a straight line forever. That's not a very straight line, but a straight line forever. But the force of gravity, yep, keeps it turning. And so every second that goes by, it falls. And what happens in orbit is that, in a way, the Earth's surface curves away from it. By the time it has fallen that much, it is now here, and the Earth has curved away. And then it's going fast enough now in this direction that by the time it's here, the Earth has curved away, et cetera, et cetera. Just like our circular motion unit, it's actually falling. And that is why astronauts feel weightless, or even how would they behave weightless. Not because gravity is turned off, right? They have a mass, 
the Earth has a mass. And there's really not that far between them. Um, I forget exactly the ratio, but it's something like if the Earth were a basketball, the ISS is orbiting at something like, um, I forget exactly how much, maybe two inches above the basketball. It's really not very far even compared to planet Earth. They're not very far away. This number is not enough that this would be zero. It's because they're falling. That's weightlessness. Let's do um, talk briefly about the tides. You have questions about any of this so far? The main things we're to take away from this, there are two kind of major misconceptions that we want to abolish about um, universal gravitation. Uh, one is this. That, and this is, this is not the misconception, this is the abolition of the misconception, is that all these forces acting on each other are equal in, in magnitude but opposite direction with the force that we think of. That is, my weight is also the same as the Earth's weight in my gravitational field. So make sure you know that. And then this one of weightlessness is another major misconception we want to banish from our minds. I'm going to draw my little diagram for tides over here. The tides. The tides go in, the tides go out. You can't explain that, Justice. Let's explain it. Um, this, make, make sure it's over here. Yeah. Which, more, which is more important for this? The moon. And do you know why? You can't explain it. It's that here is planet Earth. We'll just do this kind of briefly. Here is planet Earth. Again, it gets a lot of drawings from me today. Um, let's put the sun over here, not to scale. And let's put the moon right here. Tides are all about difference in gravity. Tides are all about difference in gravity. Uh, even on this very, very, very not to scale diagram, you can see what's the distance between the sun and this side of planet Earth? Yeah. I don't know. We can even measure it. 50 centimeters. What's the difference between the sun, the distance between the sun and this side of planet Earth? Um, it's 60, 60 centimeters. So we've got, the difference is about maybe, we could say 20 to 25 percent, right? The, 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 this is experiencing weaker gravity from the sun than this is. Why? Because of this part, right? They don't, their masses are the same. This stays the same. This must stay the same in the whole universe. But this is different between them. And that difference is called a tide. So there are tides from the sun. Now, for the moon, this is a distance of about 10 centimeters. And this is a distance of about 20 centimeters. So now you see that difference, that difference is half. Do you see how the percentage is bigger than this? And like I said, this, this diagram is obviously not to scale. In real life, the sun is much, 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 much further away from the from the Earth and the Moon is. And so this is compounded that it's not about which one is the stronger gravity, it's about which one has a greater change in gravity depending on where it is. And that's what causes the tide. So basically, the Moon pulls on this side of planet Earth, in this case, twice as hard as it pulls on this side. You see that? Or actually, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's squared. Four times as hard as how hard it pulls on this one. Or sorry, how hard it pulls on this one. So it's pulling more stuff over here, and so the Earth gets this bulge. And because the Earth is spinning, the bulge actually manifests because of um, precession and torque that we talked about in the last chapter. The bulge actually manifests 90 degrees in the rotation away from that. And that bulge is called a tide. And it doesn't just happen in the water. We notice it in the water because the land is more rigid. And so we notice the, the difference, the, uh, the tide raising compared to the land. But it also happens in the land. We don't notice it because all the land is roughly the same, but the, the land does raise and lower according to the tides, just like the water does. Just that everything raises and lowers, so you don't notice it. That's the tide. That's the tide, Justice. Yeah, because Earth's spinning and because of the gravity of the moon and the sun. And the fact that the sun exerts these forces are called tidal forces, by the way. Tidal forces. And they are the things that make um, something like a moon break up to form the rings of Saturn because that when something gets too close to a planetary body, 
or any other celestial body, uh, the tidal forces will tear it apart. So this, this action can be exacerbated, and now if you get a greater tidal force, the whole body will fall apart. It, the, the tidal forces will be stronger than the gravitation holding the planet together. Those are tidal forces. And they don't have to be, they're tidal forces whether they're like this or like that, or, or your book will talk about how if you hold a watermelon over your head, there's a tidal force that's different from your head to your feet exerted by the watermelon. So they can be very, very minor, and we still call them tidal forces. But that, um, the tidal forces are just the difference in gravity across a body, one, to the, one into the other. I was saying something. Though. Oh, um, the, the sun does exert a tidal force on the Earth, though. And so when these two things line up, uh, we call that a spring tide. When the, the high tide is higher and the low tide is lower. And that happens when the sun and the, or sorry, the moon and the earth both line up. Higher high tide and lower low tide. And that's as opposed to a neap tide when these two things are opposite each other. So if, for instance, if the moon were out here, if it were perpendicular to the sun, that would form a neap tide, which is a higher low tide, basically less, less difference, and a lower high tide. The tide goes in and the tide goes out. You can't explain that, Justice. That's the explanation for the tides. So tide. Your book has a section on black holes that I would like you to read. Um, do you have questions about the tides or weightlessness or universal gravitation in general?